Hi, everyone. It is the Janelle Show, and I am here with my good friend, Dr. AJ. How are you, Dr. AJ? Hi, friend. How are you? <laughs> I am so good. I'm so glad that you said that you would do this. Listen, y'all. Dr. AJ said that I could, she would not do this podcast interview with me unless she got to interview me next. So next episode is going to be her interviewing me and I'm a little bit scared, but <laughs> today is her turn to get grilled. <laughs> <laughs> so Dr. AJ, um, tell us a bit about what you do. So my name is Andrika J. Austin. It's Greek for strong and courageous. We shorten it to AJ because no one can spell it or memorize Andrika, but it's okay. AJ is a family heirloom, a family surname, a family name. My grandfather and my father were, was AJ and I was uh, that love child between my mom and dad. So I took on the nickname, the family name. Um, and I am a master life coach certification trainer for Black women of faith. Um, they get certified with me online in one day. I do what I love and I absolutely adore what I do. <laughs> okay, I like that. So how did you get into that business of certifying life coaches? You want short and dirty you want the like what had happened was like which version of that story you want <laughs> give me the give me the short and dirty give me the give me the give me the gist of it okay the gist of it is on april uh 18th 2008 i was leading a divorce trial making a five-year marriage trial. it was my marriage and i walked out of the courthouse got on the elevator pushed the down button the doors beginning to close. I seen my now ex-husband for the last time. And as I was descending down into the lobby, my phone rang. And as you know, on the elevator, you can't really get a good signal, but I took a chance and I answered my phone, happy that day was over and was ready to move on with my day. But little did I know on the other end, it was my cousin calling to tell me that my mom had just passed away. So here I am leaving one life, getting ready to help wrap up another life. I spent 10 years doing that. And in those 10 years, um, my job downsized. And I really had a lot of time on my hands. One of my heart's dream was to um, get my degree in psychology, but I collided with this world called life coaching when a friend introduced me during one of our daily conversations in downtime, like, well, girl, what you doing today? I don't know. We bored, you know, she just happened that day to be on her way to get certified as a life coach. And I was like, I want to get certified as a life coach. So she told me about it after the class. She paid for me to go. I paid her back. I got to say that because, you know, <laughs> uh, she paid for my hotel. She wouldn't let me pay her back for that. But it was a two day event here live in Atlanta in Alpharetta. And it was a life coach intensive. So I got trained. I got certified in two days. Um, I came home with all of my coaches' books and DVDs and tapes and CDs and studying him online and his videos on YouTube and just was really engulfed in this world because I knew this was along the path that I wanted um, because during my time of handling life, I also went back to school to wrap up my degree in psychology, ended up getting a degree in uh, training and development. Now I have a doctorate, an honorary doctorate degree in Christian psychology. So that dream came true. So I was able to combine coaching and psychology um, and my promise to God, you know, helping me through all of this in my life was that as I started to understand psychology, which is the study of human behavior and how to heal our way through life, I was also going to reach back and help others. And life coaching was how I did it. And so I spent the last five years, um, getting certified, being welcomed to the certification team for the same company that certified me and um, certifying now 147 life coaches around the world. So believe it or not, that's the short version of that story, girl. We'll have to have dinner, tea and drinks and dessert for me to finish the rest. So. <laughs> Ooh, that was a good summary of it in like two minutes. That's a short okay. version. I love it. Okay. Um, let's, let's roll it back. Let's roll it back to this ex-husband. So Hold we've never seen him again? Mm -mm. Didn't need to. Thankful I haven't. It just, Life just I, moved on. That's crazy to me. It just seems like, you know, when I have an ex, it's like I always run into them or there's some things that haven't been tied uh, up. You haven't seen him at all? 
at all. Well, I have done some stalking over the years online. Like, oh, let me see. <laughs> so yeah, I did that. Um, which I'm sure, like I get calls from not him, but other exes who have done their Google research. So I'm sure, you know, he may have had a moment or two, but I can't, you know, um, confirm or deny that. So yeah. But in person, especially uh, being in the same space, that, like, no. And Janelle, if it happens, we uh, we get in the car together, coming to knock on your door, because we're going to need some counseling, okay? It hasn't happened in all these years. And now you're bringing it up. <laughs> I'm just saying that's just a weird no thing. I, always I, know, I, know. I was driving down 285 two years ago, and I got a text message from my ex-boyfriend, and it was happened to be my birthday. And he said, happy birthday. And I said, Text him back, driving, Lord, don't, mm. but thanks. And I look to the left and there he is driving in the car <laughs> next to me. <laughs> and we dated 10 years prior. It's like, Ooh. what on earth? And he waved and I waved and we just kept going down to 85. Wow. Isn't yeah, that that's weird? weird? That's very weird. I don't want that, Jesus. And I, I don't, <laughs> but you know what? <laughs> See, <laughs> I told y'all would act right, but you know, you got to warn me. So, uh, yeah, I thought for years that that would happen. And I was, you know, I got this speech, you know, how like, if I see him, mm -hmm. I got to look good. I got to be the lost weight. My skin going to be on fleek. I'm going to be happy. That's what I'm going to say. Or would I stop and speak? Would I keep walking? Child, you know, but because of my brand now being online, there's so many people watching that I didn't even know. Um, so even if he's not watching someone he knows um, from like church or, you know, people we used to go to church would be friends with, I'm sure word has trickled down because I have seen people from that past life with him that have been like, oh, AJ, you know, so mm -hmm. those conversations, but yeah, we thank God we moving on, Janelle. <laughs> I'm just wondering, inquire minds wanted to know. Okay. Yeah. So there's no bad blood, no hard feelings. I never, um, you know, I have nothing bad to say. I'm not that type of person. I would rather just move on. You know, it happened. Here's life. We live in it. If you see me, it'll probably be on TV. And you can always say like, I knew her when. Just like the guy who dated Beyonce and dumped her. I was like, girl, I bet oh, he I saw that. the paper, you know. <laughs> I bet he's yeah, that, like, that, that's man. <laughs> <laughs> Guys, it's just water. <laughs> <laughs> okay, so back to your story. So that that story, I've, a lot of that story coincides with I have a similar story, but it seems very traumatic to me. So I feel like in the black community we don't do enough healing. Most people have mental issues, mental concerns that are not being treated. I would say 99% yeah. of the people that I know have some type of- Point nine. At the, I'm in that point nine. So 99.9. I'm consistently going to therapy to make myself a better person. <laughs> yes. It has to happen. But most yes. people do not feel like therapy is, a, is what they should do. So what did you do mm -hmm. to, to deal with that trauma? You know, being in the black community, being a black woman, we're just, you know, looked at as this pillar of strength. As I mentioned, my name, Andrika is Greek and it stands for strong and courageous. And so, you know, that's been the expectation of me as a black woman all of my life. I was raised by a black, strong, independent woman. Um, what I am learning in the life coaching industry is that the basis of life coaching, that whole foundation is built on self-care. And so one of the things that uh, Thomas J. Leonard, the founder of life coaching teaches is this mandatory list of a couple hundred things that you have to be able to check off that you're doing for yourself, everything from your mental to physical, to spiritual, to sexual, to financial health, intellectual, all of the, the things is on that list. And so I try to keep updated. And one thing I've discovered from that list is that therapy and counseling looks different for different people. Mm -hmm. So for me, in the beginning, I had nothing but Jesus, you know, growing up black in the South, we go to church. So we taught to pray about it. You know, we don't really have anyone to go talk to, or the pastor is not understanding, like, you know, it's just so much that's not available to us because we do feel like, yeah, the stigma of like, oh, she ain't counseling. It wasn't until I hit late thirties that counseling became popular, you know? Um, 
but with my tuition at Mercer University for my bachelor's in training and development came that option of having a counselor. I guess they got it like, okay, these kids are going to need help going through school. So that plus, um, you know, I was even thankful for the on-campus nurse because they helped me keep up that health part of, you know, getting checked up on like that. So in the beginning, I had nothing, but coaching has introduced me to the world of counseling, whether it is talk therapy, um, which I can kind of uh, not reap all of the benefits of talk therapy because I talk for a living for the last 20 years of my life. I coach my counselor. So my last therapist, which was another black woman of faith um, that counseled me at a church, girl, she would have her pen pad, pen and pad out taking notes. Like, now you did what now? She was taking notes on what I did in my day to day to run my, I was like, ma'am, this ain't working. I'm in here coaching you. This supposed to be my moment of counseling. I can't stand it. (laughs) Be like, just listen listen to what I got going on. Okay. Why are you trying to learn from me? In my face, it wasn't just her though. It wasn't just her. Even the counselor from Mercer, her name was Julie. And Julie would just intercept with her stories. And I'd be like, dang, Julie, I understand, you know, I'm a student and you don't take, y'all don't take us here. Julie, this is my moment. I don't need to hear what's happening at your house. I need to talk to somebody that's not my friend, that's unbiased, that's not going to tell me what I need to hear, yes. that's not going to be on my side, that can just listen with the open ear. So talk therapy, just like, no, it's, I, I can't. <laughs> so what did you find that worked for you? What I found that worked for me, honestly, just being transparent, we are I work with a lot of educated black women. So with strong wills, we're smart, you know, we're resourceful. Um, getting trained in coaching along with that sort of first certification came with this handbook. It was 88 pages, but about 20 of those pages just was full of questions, 150 life coaching questions that we were supposed to ask our clients. The beauty of life coaching is that you become your own first client Mm -hmm. first. Mm -hmm. So we were taught how to coach ourselves in the beginning, especially on your downtime. You're not coaching anyone else. You may be seeking clients, whatever you were dealing with, just like the Bible. You can look up a scripture and find out whatever you were dealing with. We had the Bible scriptures. Plus we got um, these coaching questions. So I wish I had them nearby because I kept them, but I ended up taking the pages, cutting them into little strips, just Mm -hmm. one strip one question per strip. And I can just flip through the strip and find a question to ask myself to self-coach, kind of like self-soothing um, and talk myself out of this. Because my talk therapy is, and another coach taught me this, is just to hit record on your phone. And so when I pick a question based on what I'm dealing with in that moment, hit record on the, the phone and just talk it out. At the end of the day, me having a conversation with me, myself and I, girl, that's a good meeting. <laughs> and it's on record. I can go back and listen to what I said to me, you know. So that is what I had along the way. Um, I've met some great coaches. I've met some other great counseling. But I'm still in the discovery mode of the best form of therapy because it doesn't end. I feel like it's only the process. Of my okay. Okay. That works. So now, so you t- said that your business was to certify coaches, though. So you're more than just a life coach. You actually certify life coaches. So Mm -hmm. how did that come about? So once you finish, you finish your training in Alpharetta, Mm -hmm. you do all these, these these coaching, you do sessions on yourself, you do sessions on other people. Where did the idea come to become a certified life coach coach? Right. (laughs) A coach trainer, but okay. (laughs) Okay. The technical word. (laughs) (laughs) So we, um, we got certified, um, Our coach had been training since uh, it coaching started. He actually trained under the founder of life coaching. Um, And so he was tired because he offered the opportunity for this other guy to train for a while. Then he got tired. So the same, that guy offered the training opportunity to his wife. She got tired. So then she connected with me. She and I were um, accountability partners. One day during a conversation over uh, over coffee, she said, you want to train? in my place and I was like what's your name she was like oh training and so I said absolutely like I was ready um because I had been studying and so I said yes to that opportunity that was in 2016 um and so that happened every month and then every other month then um I had the idea to bring the training online and then eventually the registration kind of went away the company kind of 
And then I still had comments saying, we've been seeing what you have been doing. You go live on Facebook. We see you speak all over Atlanta. We see people posting in their group about um, getting certified with you. We see them take pictures with you. We ready to get certified when your next training. Oh, well, I don't really have anywhere to send them now because it's trying, this company is gone. So yeah. at the top of 2020, God fired International Center for Life Coach Training. And we've been going strong ever since. And so we uh, successfully certified 30 coaches in the year 20 and it's growing from there. So that's kind of how I got started. What had happened? Where we at now. <laughs> wow, that's great. So you're saying that you started this certification, your own certification company this year, and you've trained in COVID 35 life coaches yes. in this year. So that's basically two, three life coaches, almost three life coaches per month on average. Uh -huh. That's excellent. Congratulations. Oh, sit that tea, girl. <laughs> mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yes, ma'am. So this is your full-time business. You don't work a nine to five, right? Not at all. Um, my last nine to five, I walked off the job. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. We, we don't need to talk about that. I might need some therapy over there. For real. <laughs> Let's leave that nine to five. <laughs> Where is that? Over there. <laughs> okay. So yeah, 30, uh, we're at 33 right now. I'm hoping to close out 2020 with 35 coaches, but I'm also hoping to double that um number in the year 2021 so i can't wait to go back and watch this recording a year from now to be like girl we did that it did huh you know yes, yes. 100 <laughs> in 2021 come on guys in a pandemic during quarantine let me tell you my coaches are so resilient that's why i love working with black and of faith because i understand their struggle if you will we have learned how to take what we've been through and turn it into payments, okay? And so these ladies, some of them had COVID. Some of them came into contact with COVID. One lady was quarantined for two weeks. Another lady lost her marriage because she was in the healthcare field and her husband was scared of getting COVID. At least that's the excuse he gave her, but that's on another Oprah, okay? Um, but she pushed through. She got certified. She said, coach, um, that's when I was coach AJ. Now it's Dr. AJ. I'm getting used to that, okay? <laughs> So she said, Dr. AJ, um, she said, you know, this is something I've been wanting to do. I've been wanting to become a certified life coach. It was on my list of things to do, regardless of what's going on around me, regardless of the state of the world, I'm gonna get this done. And she did. Um, that was coach Camille. She was the first woman to raise her hand this year to say, please certify me. Where do I send my payments? What's the date? What's the time? Where do I show up? And so she and I literally came up with the calendar of uh, um, our training and the times and things like that. And we brought it online and then other women followed her lead over time. And more recently we had a coach, Latresa, which I know she'll see this replay. Uh, she lost her husband 10 years ago in a fatal car crash. And now she is a certified life coach to widowed women. Mm -hmm. And when I say her ministry that's within mm -hmm. her is just strong and to know that everything I've been through and being able to share parts of my story that resonates with these women and their stories now brings them to this leveled platform and this playing field where they can impact lives. Like, girl, it made me want to cry. I got chills talking about it now. <laughs> oh, I, I have chills right now. Like, really, I was going to tell you that when you finished. Yes, that is deep. Yeah, deep. That's amazing. Absolutely amazing. So, uh, okay. you're a certified life coach trainer and you don't work a nine to five. So that means that you're a full-time entrepreneur. So I have people that listen and follow me that are dying to leave their nine to five. What's one single piece of advice that you would give to a budding entrepreneur? Something that's like actionable, but like, yes, I just needed to hear that today. What's that piece of advice? Well, uh, um, <laughs> that's my least favorite question. I know because but I it, it's, not, it's not a generic blanket statement type answer that I could give. Um, it depends on where they are in life. Like in my case, you know, I had the death of my mom happen on the same day of my divorce. And then literally a few days later, while I was out on bereavement, I got the call from my nine to five saying, um, 
See, what had happened was in 2008, it's the crash. So we had to let your team go. So when you come back, there's no team for you to come back to. As a matter of fact, you just go ahead and take an extended vacation. We'll have your things ready for you at the front desk. We're going to pack up your desk for you. So it downsized while I was out on bereavement. So in that case, I didn't have a choice in that particular nine to five of like, take the leap. I was pushed off the cliff and I I, I guess I grew wings or something. Or I'm still falling maybe. Because yeah, I, I didn't have a choice in that. Um, I was an enrollment counselor for Medicaid for people in um, different states like South Carolina who got Medicaid. I would help them choose their benefits and their doctors and benefits for their kids and stuff like that. So I really enjoy the job. Um, but I didn't have a choice of going back to that position because it no longer existed. And I know some people during this time of the COVID crisis is dealing with that right now. And so if nothing else, it taught me to have a plan. So I guess that would be the bottom line is have a plan, write the vision. What's the thing that you sat in your cubicle all those years and sketched out? I know me, I was sneaking on my laptop looking for networking events after uh, my job. I would get caught and rolled up by the supervisor. <laughs> I would have to take my lunch, my uh, laptop in the lunchroom during lunch and do some business on with my side hustle because I, I was growing my business on the weekends. Um, but I was doing it on the clock. So whatever that thing is that you've sat in your cubicle and daydreamed about, like if I could just get out of here, I would do blank. Now is the time to start sketching out that plan for whatever may happen, whether you're pushed off the cliff or you jump or take the leap of faith. Everybody claims God is leading them to. I don't feel like God would lead you somewhere that he hasn't prepared for you. And so there's a scripture in the Bible that says faith without works is dead. And so how you work your faith or your belief in your future is to start mapping out that plan. Give God something from your heart to work with or give yourself something to share with other people to say, when I leave this nine to five, this is what my life is going to look like as I venture into entrepreneurship. Um, also do what I did in my training. Get the books of those leaders in the industry you want to launch into listen to their podcasts, go to their YouTube channels, sign up for their free stuff, buy their courses, attend their masterminds, talk to people who have trained with them and see what that industry is going to be like before you take a full on dive into something that may be unfamiliar to you. So I know it's not airy fairy Pollyanna, you know, like, yes, just do it. No, this is real. You, If you got to use your business to pay your bills, you want to make sure it's going to make you money. So starting with a plan and following the clues of success that others have led, because they're now your ancestors in this space, um, that would be the words of wisdom that I would share. I love that. No, I'm not looking for anything airy-fairy. That's perfect. That's <laughs> good, solid, actionable advice. So speaking of books, what books would you, what book, one book would you suggest that a buddy, that budding entrepreneur read? The book that changed what I thought I knew about entrepreneurship. And everybody says this book, but I'm gonna tell you the story behind it before I tell it. So remember the ex-husband? Yeah, I remember him, the one that you got. <laughs> we used to go to this church with this little musician named Montel Jordan. I don't know if you know, this is how I know, we do. I know little okay. Montel, yeah, okay. Montel is my boy, right? So Montel and his wife, Kristen, they were at the church with us. This was a very small startup church. Um, the pastors had just moved down from New York and they were starting up in the Lawrenceville area. And um, we were, my ex-husband and I were the first wedding at the church and Montel and his wife actually bought my wedding dress. Oh, and I never really tell that story just because, I don't know, I just don't, but it's part of my story. Um, and they're, they were just the coolest people. And I remember his wife, Kristen, one day, I don't know what the conversation was in church, but we were so small, we could have like, you know, off scripture conversations. And she mentioned this book called Rich Dad, Poor Dad. Mm -hmm. Now I'm a nerd and I've been a reader all my life. Um, God just delivered me from like romance novels and stuff like that, that leave us with these fake expectations of love life. So I had to get rid of those and then upgrade books that were about business. <laughs> and so that was my very first business book that I went to check out from the local library, thanks to Kristen's recommendation, read it, rocked my world. 
because I thought I knew entrepreneurship from things like the candy lady in the community. If you grew up in a project, everybody had a candy lady. Miss Shirley was our candy lady. And I used to help her sell candy like she was too old to get up and down and after every kid knocked on the door. I want a popsicle. I want a pickle. I want some, um, what was it? The little fun dip. I want some gum. I want a candy bar. So I would help run back and forth to the kitchen. That's all I knew. Go to Sam's Club, stock up on this candy, come back and sell it to the hood. And that was business to me. That was the first businesswoman I know. And then my mom started her business when I was 13 years old. And it was an errand service, like the modern day Uber. So I saw her make her money by taking people around the city. Because in the early 90s, people didn't have cars on our side of the tracks in the little low country town of Douglasville, Georgia. And so these were the women that had set the standard for running a business. But when I read an author had put his thoughts into paper, here was this man that didn't look like me, didn't sound like me, but put his concept of business into a book in a way that I could relate to as a reader and a new startup. It rocked my world. Um, the chapter that stick, six, sticks out the most is, uh, it was called like, mind your business or something. And that's something we would say in the hood, like mind your business. Mm -hmm. It just stuck out to me, but it had a different connotation, how he broke it down. And so I remember passing it on to my ex-husband and was like, you should read this. And he never did. It kind of just sat around. I was like, well, you might not be doing, but I'm about to go start a business real quick. Yeah. So that bit, that book changed my understanding of business. Um, I read more of Robert Kiyosaki's um, books. I played his game, Cash Flow Quadrant. I read his wife, Kim Kiyosaki's real estate book. Like I really started digging in Susie Orman and Tony Robbins and Zig Ziglar and all of the stories of like, these successful people of Kinko's and Google and Pampered Chef and Mary Kay, Estee Lauder. I know all their stories, all thanks to Rich Dad, Poor Dad. So it's not just a recommendation. That was like the entry to this private secret portal I had no idea existed. So I know that was a long answer, but that's my story. <laughs> I love it. I love it. I remember that book. I remember that chapter. I think that I was reading that. I think, I think I read that when I was like 15 or 16 years old, I was ready for entrepreneurship from the very beginning. So yes, very good book. I might have to reread it just to get a little, I know. yeah, I think I should reread it. Um, I do too, because it's a, it's a refresher that and E-Myth Revisited. Like yeah. I have so many notes <laughs> from E-Myth Revisited because it was teaching you just not to try to do everything yourself. But um, yeah, those are the, the introduction to entrepreneurship because I think it's important um, not only to learn from people who have been successful in your industry, but also learn what business is. Because while I train in certified Black women of faith to become certified life coaches, there's a business aspect to that. Everybody's not ready to sell. Everybody's not ready to get paid. Everybody's not ready to put a price on what they do. Honestly, everybody's not ready to make money. Some people just want to show up and help. And other people know that there's an entrepreneurial piece that's missing. And that's what I always knew. Um, in my business journey, because I actually took a business planning class back in 2007 at Goodwill Industries here in Atlanta. And I be literally became their poster child. Like you can walk through their training halls and see my picture because I took everything they said and I implemented it because I knew that there was a missing piece to this entrepreneurship um, piece because you can be good at what you do, but bad at business. Yeah, <laughs> that's true. That's true. And not everybody needs to go into business. Everybody doesn't need to be an entrepreneur. It's not for the weak at heart at all. Hi. But <laughs> what is what, what book are you reading now? What have you evolved to? Uh, Let me I'm looking for the closest thing. So can you you can't really see this, but on the corner is a uh, very extra large Jessica Simpson suitcase. I just moved to another side of Atlanta not too long ago. And all of my books, 150 books are in this bag right here. And it's because on the other side of the room is a bookcase that I'm supposed to put together two weeks ago. Um, and those books go. So let's see the last book. What was the last book I read? I can't even think. Can we come back to that question? Maybe it'll come to me. Um, Cause I got all of these to read plus my Kindle on my phone, plus audio books. Um, oh, I think the last one I successfully completed was The Mindful Millionaire, the audio book of The Mindful Millionaire. Yes, that was a good I think, one. I, did I think that was the last one. And that, yeah, that um, had to do with manifestation and um, yeah, being mindful of even where you want to go as you grow in your business, as money start coming and things like that. Um, so yeah, I think that was the last one. If something else pops up, I'll share it though. If that's what comes to mind. <laughs> no, that was a good one. That definitely was a good one. I enjoyed it myself. 
Um, I really think, I'm trying to think, is there, okay, so what are you working on right now? I'd love for you to share, plug, mm. whatever you want to plug. Tell me what you have going on. Where can people find you? Um, just, yeah, tell me everything. Give us everything. And I'll put it in the show notes for you as well so that people can find okay. you and connect. So my big uh, plug all year has been blacklifecoachquiz.com or theblacklifecoachquiz.com. It's a 60 second quiz that walks you through how your heart feels about becoming a certified life coach um, online in one day as a black woman of faith. Um, whether you understand coaching or not, there's a learning opportunity there. And it's also an opportunity for people to ask me questions about becoming a coach because then I record videos like this whether it's an interview, webinar, upcoming class, workshop series, or training, um, and I share that knowledge, answering those questions. Coaching is this huge world that has so many components to it, little missing pieces, and there's a lot of miseducation out there. So my job is to show up and educate, and I do that through the BlackLifeCoachQuiz.com site, and that's my little portal to entering this huge world of opportunities to getting educating on getting educated on what coaching is, what it's not, how to become a life coach um, with me this year, how to become one of the founding 50. That's what we're calling it because we're trying to get to the first 50 coaches who have gotten certified online do, uh, with my home study course, which has been what I've been working on all year. I'm still working on that because we make updates to it all the time. And so I'm working on more opportunities to connect and collaborate and share the experience of becoming a coach with people who just like Latrisa, just like Marquita, just like Michelle and all the other 30 plus coaches who have gotten certified with me this year. I'm giving you an opportunity to come join us in that community um, because that's what I'm working on, expanding the movement of black women of faith, becoming certified life coaches, because we need to be that resource that's missing in our community. We are that answer to what's been missing in the church or outside of the church or outside of counseling sessions. Coaching is that gap filler for those people who may not wanna sit on a couch and cry with a counselor, but may wanna look at where they've been like I have and then set a plan of action to move forward and actually go do the work and get the results they say they want to live their ideal life. And so my job is to train those gap fillers to how to listen, how to ask you really good questions and how to help you move forward, actually achieving that goal. That's beautiful. That's absolutely perfect. So I will put the link to the quiz down below where you guys can um, connect with Dr. AJ. Dr. AJ, do you have any final words for the listeners? And so I want to say thank you now um, because We've known each other maybe a year now. We've been dating for a minute, you know. <laughs> and you are just one of the most resourceful people I've ever met. You're like every good business bestie in one person. And I ain't trying to like, you know, put you on no pedestal or nothing. But I'm just saying, thank you, girl. Because you too have expanded my horizon of what's out there in coaching, what's possible. And to have a fellow nerd where you can nerd out on books like The Mindful Millionaire, which you told me about, by the way, um, and other books, expanding list of, of readings that we have to do together, um, daily accountability, check-ins on the family, and what you're doing today. You're like that modern day of where it all started, you know, seeing someone else doing great things, combining those powers together. And now we're just these forces to be reckoned with that, yes, our presence even intimidates people and they in turn try to imitate us. Um, but it's a compliment to the studying, the years of taking in that knowledge, learning from some of the best. And now we're living, walking, talking, breathing examples of that. And I thank you for being that in my world and for being that for so many other people that you may not even know are watching you too, especially those little ones you have at home who have you now as their role model for what's possible. So I just want to say thank you. And to whoever's listening, come on to the community because it all trickles down from, you know, what we learn, we share. And that's what I love about us as Black women. So thank you for being a part of that circle of sisterhood, girl. Well, thank you. That was beautiful. I love it. Thank you. And everyone, thank you for listening. I appreciate you guys so much. I'd love for you guys to follow, like, and share. Have a great day.